All right, we're recording. Please go ahead. Okay, everyone, I'm uh, calling the uh, the um, Finance Committee of the Town Council to order at 10 a.m. Uh, thank you for showing up, all of you. Um, it's uh, I know it's hard to fit this into busy schedules, but uh, this is time for us to review the budget. So uh, we are holding this meeting uh, remotely uh, by uh, authority of various acts of the state legislature. Um, if uh, you have trouble hearing, please let us know and we will um, we will try to get you in. Um, there is a phone number that you can call if you have if you can't otherwise reach and you can uh, attend by phone. So I want to go around the room and make sure that um, the we do have a quorum, but make sure that we have uh, the people on the uh, committee can hear me and, and can be heard. Uh, uh, Councilor Haneke? Present. Andy Steinberg? Present. Bernie? Present. Okay, uh, I don't see anybody else. So uh, everyone that is here is, uh, we can hear and uh, they can be heard. Okay, so the first Bob, thing- uh, yes. um, part Pardon me, I'll check in with um, Kathy and Alicia and uh, just a note for Pamela, we're gonna do library first. So if you'd like to turn your camera off and just listen in until we get to DEI, that would be fine. Thank you for being here. Well, I'm gonna start, uh, go ahead and open up the, the uh, open up the, the meeting to uh, public comment. I noticed there are two people in the audience, uh, if you have a, if you want to make a comment, please uh, raise your hand, and uh, we will uh, bring you in and listen to your comment. I don't see any hands going up, so I'm going to close the public comment period. Um, I still haven't seen um, Kathy or Alicia or. Oh, there's Matt. Hi, Matt. Can you hear us? Hey, Bob. I can hear you. How am I? Great. Okay. So we have Matt present. We're just missing Kathy and uh, Alicia, but I think we should go ahead since we have a busy schedule. Um, so uh, Sharon, uh, the library is up. Welcome to the meeting. And uh, we, we sent you some questions. I hope you got them and maybe you can just go through the, the, the questions that we that we prepared and then if, I'll open it up to other questions that people have. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, can I, Athena, share my screen? Sure. You know. Hey, Bob. Yes. Um, I probably should uh, say uh, right at the beginning of the meeting that um, everybody should be aware that my wife is an employee of the library working part-time at branch libraries. And uh, I have um, consulted with the ethics commission and have determined that uh, there is no uh, problem with my participation in in this process since uh, the decisions that we make don't affect uh, her compensation. Okay, thank you. I, I see Kathy has joined us. Uh, Kathy, can you uh, hear us and Yeah, I can. Okay, yes, I can. Thanks. And I Yes, I can. And I'm trying to, I seem to have turned my video off. I am physically here. I apologize for being late. Your video is here. It's up. So. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I, um, I, I, I have in, inserted your questions uh, through a couple of slides. And um, so I'll just run through them quickly and answer any more questions that you have. Uh, your first question was about uh, the change in, in part-timers. And uh, basically for this position, we were waiting to see 
um, how the staffing at the branches would work out. Um, this is the, the first full year that we've now got two full-time staff members overseeing both branches. Uh, so Sharon, when, can I ask you to pause very quickly so we can confirm that Alicia can hear us and be heard? Yes, Alicia. Um, thank you. Sorry for the interruption, but thank you. Okay. Sorry about that, Sharon. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, when one of the part timers from the branches left, we we just decided to not refill that position. Um, and part timer positions or reductions in they really don't do anything to make or break the budget. So um, we're not looking at any future. It, it, they are never intentional cuts. It's just when people leave, we stop and look and, and decide whether or not we need to fill that position at that at that time. Okay. And, and then uh, regarding the North Amherst Library. So yeah, as as part of the expansion, Paul and I, you know, we agreed that any new expenses as a result of the expansion, the town would take care of. So now we have a memorandum of understanding with the town. Uh, so we pay rent, um, just like we do for the months. And um, so we provide services and the town takes care of uh, building expenses. Revenue questions. Uh, your first question was about the DHS grant. Uh, so this grant, uh, Lynn Weintraub received. It's a. Th it was a three. It went over the course of three fiscal years. The original amount was for one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, a little over, um, and and. Uh, so it will finish out through this calendar year. Um, there's about fifteen thousand dollars left in that, and uh, the the grant funds uh, an ESL program for seniors. Uh, it's it's a really great class. It's a great group of of older folks who. Uh, are from all over the world and they're just learning how to speak English and they're having such a good time. It's um, anyways, so that's what that's been, uh, what that money has been for. Um, and it, it, it won't renew. It was only meant to be a, a one-time three-year project. And your second question was any other grants? That is the only grant that we're budgeting for, for FY25. Uh, your question about the endowment, fabulous. Um, but really, all I can say is past performance is no guarantee uh, for future performance, whether good or bad. So um, yes, we we need about $300,000 every year from the endowment. Um, and at one point when we were sticking to the 4% draw, that was only equaling like let's say $270,000. So the, those years were hard, um, but thankfully uh, it's been going up. Uh, the, the, the amount in the endowment has been going up. So 4% uh, has been equaling more money. Um, and so, yes, I agree with your, your figures within the question. And, um, but the library has a very sound investment policy. Um, and it really just works beautifully for us. Yeah, my question to Sharon was really focused on the sustainability. And, um, you know, it, it is up and down. But what you do is you you shrink what you draw from the endowment each year, depending on, as you said, the last 12 months or whatever. Is that correct? It, it's based on we take a trailing uh, 12 quarter average. So regardless of how high or how low, you know, the crazy stock world uh, uh, happens, it doesn't, it, it doesn't hurt us or help us. Uh, we stay, we're, we stay right down the middle. And um, it really, it's, it's a beautiful system. I got to say, it's as close to perfect as I can get. Okay, under expenses uh, and, and state aid. So um, it, it, it is very rare when uh, the library doesn't need state aid uh, 
to pay salaries uh, because uh, the town appropriation just has never covered uh, all of our salaries. Um, I've only been here 12 years. I, I think I've seen it twice where we didn't need additional money above the town appropriation. Um, the, one was the FY23 uh, year, and that was because the, the SEIU contract negotiations were going on over a couple of different fiscal years. Um, and then the other was just due to, we had several retirements of uh, employees who had been working here for several decades. So um, th it ended up saving us a lot of money. Um, so uh, your question, are we relying on state aid? Absolutely. Um, and <laughs> we know not to ever expect a 4% uh, increase to the town appropriation um, that, you know, this FY25 was just a, a really happy once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and we're very happy about it, but we do understand that, you know, we're lucky if we get a 3% or a 2.5% and then the norm is, is more like 2% percent, maybe even one and a half percent. So it, because we have so many other buckets of money, um, it, it generally works out. Uh, the, the tough years were when we were, the trustees were, were bringing the endowment draw rate down to that 4% because it had been higher during previous trustee administrations. Um, but now we're on this 4% course. But, but as we were dipping, we had to uh, pull out of reserves. And, um, and, and, and now we're, we're on the upward trend again, and we've got um, some reserves. So, uh, so it's working out well. Um, thankfully, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, the Massachusetts Library Association, they do a, a superior job of informing and advocating uh, for state aid to public library increases um, ac across the state. The legislators do understand the importance of, of this fund uh, to public libraries, again, across the state. Um, Mindy and Joe are exceptional advocates and partners in this. Um, and but of course, always cuts can occur. And, and like I said, that's why it's important for the library to have so many different uh, buckets and, and, and reserves. Yeah. I think, I think those are all your questions. Well, we did Happy have to a, take more. We did have a few questions, other questions. Um, we, it was more um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, climate goals and um, sustainability and um, opportunities to share equipment and you know, there there were some questions that were related to the uh, town manager goals uh, that um, we wanted you to see if you had any any additional things to talk about related to those. Uh, related to sustainability, so that would be that's the building project, um, and so uh, we're working on plans to right. Uh, see that through other other than that no that's that is our primary focus right now okay uh, the elimination of fossil fuels okay do you have any uh, are there any um grant opportunities other than you know for for building for is for any grant opportunities for uh for uh, you know sustainability investments that that aren't related to the renovation or the rebuilding of the library uh i don't know uh that's where 150 percent of our efforts are <laughs> are so. okay okay i'm going to open it up to the committee for other questions i can't see everyone so sharon if you could stop sharing oh yes absolutely I... actually i'm seeing kathy uh yeah on um... It might be that she needs to keep sharing, but on the um, expense table that you showed us, Sharon, and I apologize, I didn't get my questions into Bob and Athena in advance so that you could um, respond to them. 
Um, the FY25 budget has a substantial decrease in three lines, maintenance, utilities, and programming. And I'm assuming that's the assumption that you're you're moving to a rental place um, as opposed to staying in the building. If that doesn't happen, um, you know, so I, I it's a two-part question. It's 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 about $120,000 of expenses that you're not expecting to incur that leads you to your bottom line, if I'm reading it correctly, um, compared to uh, FY24 budget. Um, both if that doesn't occur, what happens? And we look forward to a year, you know, another year, FY26, where we'll be back to uh, uh, the operations, maintenance, repairs, utilities budget. What happens then in terms of your thinking of, of the people programming? We didn't ask you for a multiple year budget, but I'm just looking forward to when the library is back online because it, it, I'll stop there. And so, they, so the one other one is the the friends. There are a few that are lower than they were in the past. Friends is one that's quite a bit low. So it looks like the fundraising from friends has gone down. Um, so that's just you might want to talk about that. So the I understood your first and your third question. I didn't understand your second, but we'll get back to it. So the uh, your first question. Um, so when when the trustees approved this budget, it, it was assuming we would be out of the Jones Library for the full fiscal year. So I, uh, we, we will ha definitely have to create an adjusted budget, um, but I'm not expecting it to um, to change the bottom line. Um, and you know the, the municipal appropriation is what it is. The endowment draw is what it is. State aid is what it is. Um, and so we work within um, whatever the revenues are. So I think that was the first question. The third question was the friends. So um, because of the building project, uh, the uh, annual, so we're, we're running two campaigns at the same time, the capital campaign and the annual fund. And, and th this is true even for me, I'm contributing less for the annual fund because I'm giving uh, to the capital campaign. And, and that is pretty normal in, in, in towns for libraries that are running large capital campaigns at the same time. Uh, so that we believe that is why there's less annual fund money coming in from the friends. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, it just means when we were putting this budget together, I wanted to be as conservative as possible because there are so many unknowns. So this was even when we were gonna be in a different space. Um, the utilities, for example, uh, it was, it, it, uh, it was based off of, you know, UMass gave me some of their uh, expenses over the past year and it, it doesn't, it, it's, it's a lot of educated guessing. Um, and so, so you all know crafting these budgets a year and a half in advance is difficult. Um, and which leads me into, I think, where you were trying to go with your second question, which is, you could ask me to go out two years, but I, it would not be a reliable uh, budget at all. Um, it, yeah, it, it would. It, it, yeah, it just would. And the, the reason I asked about this, you know, out two years is I'm just looking at the, um, you know, an operation, several of the budgets you're assuming will go down a lot in the year. And my understanding, and I might be wrong, is you're, you had a, some money in the larger project for paying rent to moving to another place. So you've got a drop in utility, you've got a drop in maintenance because you're not in the current building. So if I take it out a year, those costs come back online and interact with Bob's original question of there's only going to be so much of an increase in the town allocation. So are you going to be, does, does the way you're funding it all work if you go out a year? And what you're saying is it, that's too far in advance 
for you to think about it. <laughs> you know, and it's I'm not just, that I'm not thinking about yeah. it. Um, it's always it, it it's always there, but I I believe it would be not a good use of people's time to put numbers down that I really believe would not be something yeah, that you it, could rely on. And it was just that it's one hundred and twenty thousand dollars less in FY twenty five than than FY twenty four from those three items. So it's it's not a small amount of money if you say, okay, that's going to come back in. So it's it's just worth thinking about it. And I don't, I know you're in this limbo land right now on, are you moving out of the building? Um, so um, I think I think that's it. And then the friends, you're if you're hoping it comes back up, I mean, I actually a couple of years ago asked if you thought you would sustain friends while you're doing the building project. And you said it wasn't going to be a problem because I thought it, but I think it is a problem the same way you're saying, you know, that you don't give to the annual fund. If you're giving to the building fund, you don't necessarily keep this stream up. So are you thinking that that's going to come back up to where it was in the past? Um, and you're probably going to say, you don't know, <laughs> but no, but it's yeah, people, you know, I can use myself as an example. Yeah. When the capital campaign is, is paid off, then I will go back to giving my money for the annual fund. You, you know, have... the, the, the town values library services and, and honestly, most townspeople, most community members, they're not, they're not paying attention to the building project and the, and the, the nooks and crannies that you all are paying attention to, um, they are, they support the library and, right. and, and to them, you know, it's programming and, and staffing. That's why they're coming. Um, and so they'll, they'll continue to give. But you, you've got programming down substantially about a third lower than where you have been. And is that again, because you're thinking you're going to be doing it online programming or, as opposed to in a building no. program? No. So as I said before, I was going super conservative. Uh, if if we end up raising more money and staff have the time, then awesome. You know, we'll, we'll add more programming. But I, I didn't want to make those kinds of promises. And then, you know, a year later when we do the actuals for everybody to say, well, what happened, Sharon? Honestly, uh, being in an interim space is extremely complicated, uh, nerve wracking for staff. Staff are spending a lot of time thinking about all the different um, all the different things that it takes to move 100 years of, of services to a different space that's much, much smaller. Um, and, and programming kind of has to take a backseat for a little while. So that's why we reduced the programming figures. But again, if, if money should, should flow and, and staff are like, oh, here's a once in a lifetime opportunity, then we'll go for it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Sharon. Oh, no, Mandy or Councilor Haneke. <laughs> yeah, um, this question I'm going to be asking to a number of different departments and the manager and all. Um, and so it doesn't specifically apply to just the Jones Library. But when I look across departments, particularly Recreation, Senior Services, DEI, and Jones, um, we seem to have a number of departments that are planning events and activities for town residents, potentially for the same town residents, but different activities in different departments. And, you know, recreation does the 4th of July thing, and they also do a lot of youth, but they also do a lot of adult type programming. Um, DEI is doing a lot of cultural events. Uh, the library does some of the cultural events and does some uh, other programming for youth and this and that. Um, is there ways to make all of that more efficient, combine resources to either expand services for a similar cost, you know, because you're not doing the same thing duplicatively sort of? And have you ever talked to those departments about the possibility of working together, particularly if the library is moving to continue sort of similar programming, but through a different department because they've already got that ability and are working on very similar things already. How does all of that programming amongst town departments work from your perspective? And is there ways to create efficiencies to save money or create efficiencies to expand services? 
So what I've seen in, in, in the 12 years that I've been here is a greater departmental collaborations. Um, it, it's awesome. And it's been one of the benefits, I believe, of us moving out and not having programming space is it is forcing staff to strengthen these um, inter these collaborations even more. Um, so for example, we were going to work with REC in the schools and our summer reading program was going to happen at the school department as part of uh, camps, the, the, the um, Rex summer camp. Um, Rec has been fabulous. Our ever since the DEI and Cress departments were created, we've um, we've been like this. And um, so I don't think I don't think we're duplicating. I think we are beautifully, you know, for example, Rec does 4th of July. We can't do 4th of July. We could do a story time on the common during 4th of July. And so it's like we all just know what historically programs have happened and we link up and see how we can add to it. Um, and as new programs are created, then we have found that people just reach out to the library and, and, um, it's really awesome. We we genuinely have the best colleagues in the world. So, so again, I, I'm not seeing extra money being spent. Like I don't see us doing a story time and Rec doing a story time and DEI doing a story time. It, we're all handing in together what we're good at, I guess. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Well, for the second time, Sharon, thank you for for uh, being with us and uh, for answering our questions. And uh, we'll uh, move on to the next part of our agenda. So next, I believe we have DEI, if I'm correct. Uh, is that correct? Pamela? Yes, yes, DEI is right. next. Uh, Pamela? Hello, everyone. Hi, did you want to say anything to start with? I did not prepare um, any statement. That there was not a, a huge ask from DEI where my focus over the last six months have really been on working with uh, the Crest Department and trying to help with their planning. So um, I can give you a uh, brief overview about what our hopes are for next year, if that would be helpful. I think so. Sure. So my first hope is to hire someone in as the assistant director, since I'm now a department of one, right. um, with three events between um, today and the end of June to, to complete. Um, and uh, we've I've had some conversation with the town manager and hope to have that position posted uh, early next week. Um, the main sort of programming initiatives for the department have centered around um, workshops for both the public um, and town residents, as well as for staff. So um, the department hosts a monthly DEI workshop for staff, that's staff only. Um, that's done intentionally so that staff members will have an opportunity to learn about the various DEI topics um, in a setting that feels uh, more comfortable. In addition to that, we have um, started and um, are now, I guess, we'll be on our third event coming up um, later in the summer, uh, Becoming Beloved Community. It's a series of uh, topics that are open to the general public. We start the started that program with the National Day of Racial Healing in January that follows the Martin Luther King holiday. Um, we most recently had a workshop on microaggressions and implicit bias. The next one that's uh, coming up in July will be on um, allyship. Um, and so that series has a more public face. In addition to that, um, the department has as a goal providing workshops and trainings for each department that are department specific. I have to be honest and tell you that that did not happen um, very much this year, simply because my time was spent working as part of the interim leadership team. And so 
we focused on the broader workshops that were for staff and forego the more specific ones from the, from the department. In addition to that, um, as you know, the department supports um, four different boards. So the Human Rights Commission, the Disability Access and Advisory Commission. Jennifer was also supporting the Munson um, Trustees and then the Community Safety and Social Justice Commission. Okay, thank you. Did uh, anyone have questions for Pamela? Uh, Councilor Haneke? Yeah, so this was one of the general government sections that I reviewed um, and sent in some questions. My questions for um, specifically related to DEI that are more for um, our director versus our town manager um, relate to three of the town manager goals, um, as well as the question I just asked our library director about the, the, the combination of services, although that one was not sent in early, um, but I'd love to hear. So, so two about budgeting strategies related to using a racial and social justice lens when making decisions and um, how the budgeting strategy supports the work of the town in repairing the damage to structural racism. Those are two of our manager goals. So that, that's sort of one question there. Another question is one of the manager goals is to begin identifying and proposing revisions to policies, bylaws, regulations to dismantle structural racism. Um, and I'm curious how this budget for DEI supports doing that, especially when in the DEI's upcoming objectives section, which is sort of, I, I read as your goals for the next year, mm -hmm. uh, identifying those policies to begin doing that is not one of those upcoming objectives. So I'd like you to speak to that manager goal and how the budget will help you start that goal. And then the other one is that cross sort of department workings when there seems to be a lot of departments that are doing scheduling, planning, hosting events and all. And do you talk to recreation and senior services about working together so that you're not sort of duplicating efforts or your things like that? The same, that, that same question that was to the library director. All right, so I'm gonna take the easy one first and actually start by, um, uh, actually just talking about one of uh, the recent events that we've had in the last year. I think that's the best example to answer the collaboration that's occurring between the library rec um, and other departments. So if you um, had an opportunity to ex attend our spring festival or Lunar New Year event, then you would have found that um, that there were representatives from the rec department there and that rec had created gift bags for children who attended and that there was a section during the event where the library had um, created uh, a lending library with books that were um, appropriate and re um, relevant to the topic. And so I agree with Sharon. I think this is one area where um, the various departments in town have worked collabor collaboratively together and that we're not duplicating uh, efforts, but we're actually enriching the efforts of each other by sharing events. So I think you will see that um, again uh, with an upcoming event that we have um, actually a week from Saturday, we have the AAPI, so the Asian American Pacific Islander event, and we have assistance from REC and generally there's also a presence there from the library. So I think um, as town departments, we're working very well on those cultural events to really enhance them. Um, I'm sad to say I, I'm hearing about the other two questions uh, during this meeting. They did not come to me in advance, um, but I do have a response for you. Uh, I think the, the major handicap to my ability to work with the town manager to reach those larger DEI goals is um, a lack of staffing and time, right? Uh, if my time and energy is spent on cultural events, then that's less time and energy that I'm able to, to spend on some of the bigger policy questions. Um, and um, as particularly in this past year, it's been very difficult because I was leading the interim leadership team for CRESS and trying to do work on this um, in this department as well. So. Um, so that is definitely a challenge. Uh, I want to sort of end with to sit by saying that it's not as if those 
activities are not happening. The best example that I can give you from the past year was that the Human uh, Rights Commission had set as its goal the revision of its bylaw um, so that it does meet, uh, meet and reach for those larger goals. And we're in the process of doing that. And the Disability Access and Advisory Committee as well is looking to revise um, its charge and take on a different legal status. So there has been some movement, but certainly um, probably there is room and capacity for more. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions for Pamela? Okay, I think we'll move on then. Uh, Kathy? It's a comment. I just want to thank you. Because um, I know you've had to step up the way you've just described to fill vacancies and work across. And I watched the amount of hugging and other kinds of kudos that came in, in the meeting with the new Crest director. So I think you've won the trust um, and respect of multiple people, both inside the town, but across all our residents. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? I apologize for the noise outside. <laughs> Someone has just decided to blow the leaves outside. <laughs> um, okay, why don't we move to uh, the next uh, part of our presentation, uh, facilities. Uh, I'm not sure if either... Here Rob, he is. Jeremiah, Jeremiah? Yes, hello. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, um, I, I suppose I didn't really uh, prepare uh, much for this um, uh, as far as presentation, um, like I typically do. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but it's, but essentially, you know, the goals, the goals for um, the facilities department is, is to continue supporting um, the facilities and, or the, the town staff and community um, and, and all of the different programmings and activities and um, ensuring that the environment of care and the buildings are kept up as, as well as possible. Um, we do have uh, quite a bit of uh, capital work planned for this, this coming year and we've been uh, cleaning up a lot of uh, older deferred uh, maintenance projects. Um, one of the questions that, that it was asked to me was, uh, uh, about the North Amherst library and what the, um, uh, financial ask for expenses would look like. I did share that out this morning. I'm not sure if the committee was able to see that, uh, but essentially it, it outlines, uh, the, the anticipated expenses uh, for the year. Now, some of them uh, are uh, sort of a, a gen general, more uh, a little bit of guesswork and with the building being s so fresh, uh, we, we may not have uh, that, that information as of yet, uh, but I did my best to try to project those numbers. Uh, so this is what, uh, yeah, thank you, Athena. This is, this is what it looks like. Any questions? Bob, Mandy has a hand up. You're muted, Bob. Sorry, but... I'm muted. I <laughs> sorry. Uh... Too many things going on. Uh, Councilor Haneke. <laughs> okay, so a couple questions. I'll stick with this chart for now. So this, it, from from what you just said, this I believe is just the North Amherst Library operating expenses for facilities. And if so, are is that already built into the town's budget facilities numbers? And what is the difference between what the town was paying before to operate this building and now? Uh, so the, all all of the expenses for the North Amherst Library were being paid by 
the Jones Library. So essentially, these are new expenses for for us. Um, so the the form that you're seeing here is is basically the additional uh, requests. So that this is me requesting that those funding to uh, that that would end up getting built into um, uh, the, the facilities budget moving forward. But but at, at, since it's the first year, um, these are that's an additional ask. Can I? Is it in the FY twenty five budget then, somewhere? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I I want to ensure that I'll have to get back to you on that, but I I believe the it was discussed when I met with um, uh, uh, San Sandy and and some of the other leadership uh, uh, to discuss uh, the FY. 25 budgets. So I would have to confirm that. Okay. I, I think I think Sandy can answer that question. Um, that would Bob. be great if Sandy could. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, we, we put $9,330 into the facilities budget for the North Amherst operating expenses. Those were the numbers that were uh, asked of us back when we had our meetings this winter. Um, I don't, not sure what is different from the numbers that are on the sheet you have in front of you, but there was an additional $9,330. Okay, so that increase on page 110 of that change in the facilities maintenance operating expense line is specifically for North Amherst Library. Okay. Because yes. the main, it, again, I, I know how much pressure you were on the major components utilities description. Maybe for next year, make a note to describe that that also includes the North Amherst building now, library building, because the utilities line talked about Munson and Bangs and North Amherst School and South Amherst campus, but didn't mention the library. Just a note for next year. <laughs> Some sort of note so that we know that it, that building's also included in there would be very helpful. Yeah, Excellent. Mandy, that's one of one of the things that that we've discussed and and um identified that some of these the budget narratives um it it only included some portions of all of the facilities and you know like you say is over the years it, it, the 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 number of buildings keeps increasing and we want to sh be sure to capture that. Uh, we are in other areas. So we'll just we'll just continue to to show that. We'll just transpose that more complete information onto that. Kathy. Yeah, I want to build on this set of questions for the scope of the buildings. Um, so for Munson, do we do the same thing for Munson? Do we pay all the electric, all the waste, all the sewer? And and the Jones pays none, so that's been past practice. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um. So then, my second question, and I don't expect you to give me an answer, but I I can get an answer later, is when the community uses community space in either Munson or the North, and in the case of the North Amherst Library, there hasn't been any community space until now. Um. I think you charge some fees. Do the fees get booked in a way that you can see how much of the cost of operating the building is offset by fees is a question um, for wherever those fees go. And they may be, um, I, Jeremiah, when we were asking about rent, renting per hour, he said it's pretty nominal, like $15, $20 an hour. Yeah. but. But I I don't I don't know how that works um, with Munson and I and we none of us know how it's going to work with North Amherst. So it's do is there kind of a some of this cost is offset with fees? There there should certainly be a, an offset. Um, I I don't know what those figure figures are, uh, but but we are but you are right. It's for for a nonprofit organization the the fee schedule is fifteen dollars per hour. 
And I believe it's a little bit higher if it is not a nonprofit. Um, we are in the process of uh, updating the, the booking systems and, and uh, essentially the, the, the process of um, reserving and paying those fees. So I think next year we, we would be able to get that information much easier because uh, we were, we were going to start using our open, open gov software. Um, so it, he, this it would, this year, I think would be a little bit more of a challenge, but I could certainly find out that, that information for you. Yeah. And okay. it's not, it's not critical. I was just thinking that internally there are some fees. I see Paul's hand is up. I, on on this one so yeah so we, we do uh, all the those fees come in and they're recorded accordingly to wherever they go they just go into the general fund so it's part of our revenue streams uh there we don't do zero based budgeting by building on this or anything like that so um but and with the the thing that the rob and jeremiah and our it department put together for using open gov which are has been really successful for inspection services we're rolling that out for Munson and for North Amherst Library, and if that works well, um, you know we're still working through a bunch of things and who, who you know decisions and stuff. There's some in right now, in fact. Um, then we hope to expand that to the banks and other. And we do charge a nominal fee. It's important to charge a nominal fee or some fee, because it, otherwise people sign up and they don't need to show up. So, and we're looking at using this for the town common as well. So there's a lot of opportunities. If we can get it online, that it becomes more transparent to the public. People can see when it's available, they can sign up. We, there are policies that have to go along with it because we prioritize town events. Um, but in terms of the, the revenues that generally will go just to the general fund as all of our revenues do. Okay. So can I just stay on, and I see Mandy's hand is up. So. The two other buildings, when you went, Mandy added North Amherst Library to the list of facilities, but we've got the old North Amherst School up here, and then we have the, um, in South Amherst, that are listed as their storage facilities. Um, um, to the extent we have utility and maintenance costs for those, um, my question is a broader one, Paul, than, than Jeremiah can answer. It's at what point do is maintaining them for storage does it make sense and when do they move from being a storage facility to being a surplus property that or mm -hmm. a potentially surplus that we might want to use for other reuse in other ways mm -hmm. um the north so i'll say in the the old one it's up it i see it on a daily basis because i drive that way but the North Amherst School used to have a family center program as well as, and I think it still has the um, uh, the snap. Some of the um, I'm just blanking mm -hmm. on the name, but and it's and it I think it had a Head Start program that it's not going to have anymore. So some of the space was being rented. So going forward, is that empty space um, that we're looking at non rented space? Yeah. So on that one, so we are in negotiation or discussions with um, Head Start. You know, they don't need the head, they can't staff their Head Start services. They still have an office there. I think it's for fuel assistance or something like that. So it is still, we're still getting revenue from that. They're reducing, they've asked to reduce their rent is basically what they've asked because they're not using the space. That's important space for us to maintain. I'm sure we don't turn off the heat and water and things in that because of building. But, you know, as we look at potential areas where if we need swing space, that's an important location for us. Um, the South Hammer School, I think the, the utilities are turned off. Jeremiah can answer that. And then want to just mention that in on page 110, we do mention under significant change that the operating expenses increased due to North Amherst Library edition. So that is mentioned in the actual budget document. Thank and you. can you just answer the South Hammer School, Jeremiah, do we have utilities on there? We, we do. It is very minimal. Uh, so the electric uh, it remains on and that that just helps with s some protections of the space because um, even even though that the, the building isn't occupied it we're still obligated to um, maintain all the life safety equipment such as you know fire alarm system uh, spring sprinklers if there were um, extinguishers so um, I do need to have the electricity on um, to to main, maintain those life safety systems, uh, but the rest of the the, the uh, systems such as water uh, have all been um, 
weatherize or winterize. So we're not we're not using anything there. Thank you. Uh, I'm finished. Thank you. Council Haneke. Thank you. And I apologize. I missed that that small line and the significant changes. So next year it should just bump up, I guess, into the major components. So sorry about that. Um, a couple other questions about facilities. Um, there's an addition of a 0.8 FTE in the facilities personnel line um, for FY25. So I'm curious what that addition is. I think it might be the special projects manager, but I just want to confirm. Um, particularly since Sandy said there were no FTE additions other than in inspection services in this budget. Um, so when I see one, I, I want to see sort of what they are and how they're being paid for and all, um, and sort of the long-term trend of, of that FTE addition. Solar installation on the landfill, um, I don't know how things work, but where are the decreases in utilities within the departments is that within this facilities budget that we haven't really you know this this operating expense line is actually higher um so so where do where is the savings from the landfill solar or any of the other sort of sustainability utility initiatives we've done where does that show up in the budget is a question um, and how, if there are actual savings, how are they redistributed to any particular department in terms of budgeting expenses and all? Um, and similar with that, gas and oil usage is down within this facilities budget. When you look at the page 111, um, in electric is increasing. Is that a result of our sustainability initiatives and switching things out. Like I believe Munson was just switched out from an oil-based system, HVAC system to an electric-based system. Is is that why we're seeing that change within those kilowatt hours and actual usage of utilities? Uh, those are my questions. So I can answer some, but why don't you start Jeremiah because you can answer the more detailed ones. Sure. Um... So I guess working working backwards through the questions, uh, the 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 change, uh, the increase in electric, uh, and the de decrease in the fossil fuel usage is a result of electrifying um, some of the buildings and uh, just re removing some those systems. Um, North Amherst School, uh, all, all the ground level that was uh, completely. Um, uh, all the fossil fuels equipment was removed and, and it's now all um, high efficiency heat pumps. I also uh, changed out uh, a, a number of hot water heaters and did a hybrid heat pump um, hot water heaters as well. Um, I'm not sure where you're going to jump in, Paul, but I, I, as far as the landfill, I, I can't necessarily speak on to how, how that uh, that's um, how that money is coming. I, I can out. address that. I can address yeah. that. So on the landfill, when we start to get the credits, uh, Sean Magano basically went through all the utility bills of the different departments and started to apply the credits based on um, you know based on the the use of the electricity by department and. We just had to make a call. The you know Eversource was saying, "Where do you want us to apply these credits?" And he just went through and made a decision on where those go. I think one of the reasons for that one was that if you look at our budget, operating expenses have not and in, are not increasing very much at all, if at all, and hardly anything. And that's one of the complaints you may hear from our department heads is that we're our expenses are going up, and you're asking us to do more. So if there are any cost savings based on utility savings, electricity savings, or anything like that. We want them to experience the benefit of that in terms of their operating budgets because everything they're buying is costing more, um, but we're not giving them more money to to pay for salt or fuel or whatever it is that they're that they're getting. Uh, and then in terms of the other question about yes, the um, the so Bob Perrin is a current staff person who's being paid out of ARPA. Um, he's on he, we can we're allowed <laughs> excuse me allowed to pay him through December thirty first. He has been such an important part of our uh, team and he's willing to continue to serve. So we felt it was a priority to include that. He works part-time, um, so it's not a full-time position. Um, so including him into our budget, we wanted to make that, start to begin getting that transition for that position. So it's a six months of a part-time position is what that reflects. Thank you. 
and so I, I just, for my own brain, all of those utility expenses that are savings aren't necessarily showing up in the facilities maintenance operating expense line per se. They're more sort of hidden in the budget because I, and I had noticed like DEI and, and town clerks and all of these, those, their operating expense lines are almost always this year, a lot more even mm -hmm. like level spending. And that's sort of how you're incorporating the solar savings into the budget is sort of a level spending on operating expense lines in various departments. Well, we had to apply, apply it to uh, departments that had um, electricity in their budgets. So DEI doesn't have electricity in their budget, Those, um, but you know, DPW does a uh, police facility and there, Jeremiah's got a lot of different facilities that have it. So he has to manage, most of them accrue to, um, to, to facilities. Thanks. Bernie. Creation. <clears throat> um, as we look at these budgets and we think about inflation, we have to keep, I think, two things in mind. One, the fact that the rate of inflation is dropping doesn't mean that things are getting cheaper. It just means that expenses aren't going up as fast. That's one. And two, we look at the consumer price index, and then you probably can add a point or two onto that for cities and towns, because a lot of the stuff we buy is not the same stuff that households buy, and a lot of the stuff we buy is more expensive. So if we're... Um, looking at budgets that are keeping operating costs uh, at, at a uh, increases at a minimum. Um, we're also, we're, we're fighting those inflation factors as well. So I just want, um, we want to just raise that as a point. Thank you. Kathy. Um, the discussion on the solar and how you've allocated Paul, um, I think, it, it may be already in the, the budget book and I just didn't see it, but I think it's a very good news story. And if in, in a, like we saved this much money in electric costs because we got X amount from solar um, from on the landfill. And I don't remember seeing that. So it, it mm -hmm. would be just useful to have it as, and I'm not saying add something to the budget book, but maybe in a presentation to the town or something because it to the extent um you know we're we're going to see it embedded in the new school because we're expecting it to offset all the electric so you'll see a for electric costs you'll see a near zero line mm -hmm. in it but that's not because the all electric school uses no so it's just a way of quantifying yeah. for people that we've invested in something that we're getting a long term payoff mm -hmm. Is, I, I think I can, or I think I can ask accounting to dig into that. Yeah, That's it's just it it's just a really good. But point. you're right; it's a good thing to have. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Jeremiah? All right, I think we'll move on then. Thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, Thank you. Next is town manager budget. Correct. Uh, yes. All did you want to have a presentation, a brief presentation, or would you just prefer to jump into the questions? I want to just recognize uh, Angela Mills here, who's okay. front and center for this as well. Ours is pretty um, basic. <laughs> I don't think there's, I'm open to questions you may have. Um, Bob, just a quick note. Um, we specifically didn't ask departments to do presentations. So I All think right. the question is sometimes alarming <laughs> to our department heads who are attending going, oh no, I was told I don't need to do that. So just so we don't give anybody else a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I should have, I, I, I know that's the case and I should have uh, stated that earlier, but thank you. Uh, Councilor Haneke, do you have questions? Mm. So yeah, again, I was the one that reviewed all of the general government section of this budget, which includes more than just the manager's subsection. And, and also, so I apologize, Paul, that some of these questions are to other departments, but I think they're not specific enough that they're they're sort of higher level that, that you or Angela will probably be able to handle them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first set is... Um, 
the I noticed in reviewing the general government section that throughout the various departments, the personnel services had a large mean increase of about 9%, anywhere from a personnel services around four to 17 or 18, depending on, on various different things going on in the departments. Uh, my concern is not necessarily, oh, that department was 20%, oh dear. My concern is overall, it's well above 4%. Um, and is this something that is manageable year over year when we're expecting not just next year, but but FY 26 and 27 to have maybe a two and a half percent overall increase. Um, so so could you just address that? Yeah, no, you put your fingers on something that's a, that's we're hyper conscious of, and it's going to be a challenge because as we all know, uh, labor costs are increasing. Our collective bargaining agreements, just like the schools, are um, above two and a half percent. We're managing that and trying to do two things. One is make sure our employees are are being paid at an equitable rate and recognizing inflation, but also in insinuating into our contracts some long-term savings. So in terms of step increases and things like that. So we're trying to make that um, smaller step increases, I'll say. And so that's been a challenge for us that we've been really working through to, um, union contract by union contract. As you may know, um, last year, uh, it was goal of the council as, my, as was mine to do a compensation classification study, um, which we which we did do. We had an outside firm come in. It took a pretty long time to get done. Um, it actually spanned a, um, a couple of fiscal years, um, but that we were trying to build this budget to incorporate the recommendations from that into this budget so we could stay within our allocation of 4% going forward and accommodate those budget adjustments that were required um, based on the compensation classification study. So I think we were successful in doing that. Um, and I think that our employees were uh, generally, um, I won't say pleased, no one's ever pleased. I say um, we, we had a process where if um, people were unhappy with the decision made about their role that they could appeal to the uh, personnel board. Um, and I, I'd have to talk to uh, Melissa to see if any, that was an out, a process outside my purview. So I'm not sure if, if who, if anybody went and took advantage of that uh, um, request, the you know, appeal process. Uh, Councilor Haneke, did you have a response to this or? Uh, no, uh, just uh, other questions. I don't okay. know whether you want me to group them or or Andy can go next. It's fine okay. too. Yeah, I was just going to call on Andy because he has his hand up. Andy? Um, my question had to do with the communications manager, which you list as one of the major components of your um, office's uh, personnel expenses. And that's a position. And, uh, the person who had been in it full time has had left, and uh, has that been? Uh, part, is there anybody working in that in, in in the current time? And when do you expect that to be filled? How does that affect the budget? Well, if you and you don't see all the hats that Angela has, but she is. This is something that she has taken on. But she's also. We had a really good team interviewing, and Angela, you can update on where we are with the interview. Where we are on that process for replacing. Brianna. Over the past month and a half, we've had um, a huge applicant pool. We were really lucky to have lots of qualified people apply. We are hoping to have finalists sit with Paul in the next five to 10 days. So we've narrowed it down to two finalists. And the search committee was excellent. It was Serge Fedorowski from IT, Lindsay Carroll from APD, and our health director, Kiko Mallon, who helped out with all of the interviews. So you would expect that the position is going to be filled for the fiscal year and, or, and that therefore it's in it's covered in the budget. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilman Haneke. Um, a couple more questions from the questions I sent over. Um, HR has an ad of a 0.56 FTE. Can you talk about what that's for? Um, let's see, Sandy, <laughs> I think, uh, I don't really remember what that was. Um, 
off the top of my head. Do you have any more with that list, Andy? They had... Is it to make up for the HR piece that Jen? So we're we're taking the HR piece out of the um, DEI director. So when when Jen Moyston, Jen Moyston used to be half time with the with town manager and half time with HR. When she moved over to DEI, she took out the town manager part but kept a portion of the HR piece. We don't, and that was just because she had experience and was really good at, at that work. Um, where we're recruiting for the new D assistant director for diverse DEI, we're not putting in the HR piece. There, there's going to be a recruitment piece part of it, but it's not going to be directly related to HR where she was actually doing tasks for the HR. Um, so if, if that's the case, then are you essentially by pulling her half time out of the DEI side, adding a half time position somewhere in this budget, i.e. in HR or or because DEI didn't show an increase in FTEs. It's just a job description change. I think we, I, th I don't have a ready answer for you on that one, Mandy Joe. We'll have to look it up. I'll mark it for later. Unless, unless <laughs> Andy knows. Um, my other, uh, another question I Sam, have Sam is. Sam trying to speak. He can't oh, find the sorry. EU button. I think I'll he's wait for Sandy there. There's there. too many you. screens going on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and what I'm going to say is I don't know the answer. Holly <laughs> did the, um, mm -hmm. these charts. The personal cuts, yeah. And um, she's not here today or next week. So when she gets back, uh, we can have somebody follow up on that. Um, it was not a, I'm looking at my sheet of um, department head requests. So it's not here as a dollar request. So it must have been something else, but I just don't know what it was. Following up is fine. <laughs> I'll mark it on my follow-up list. Mm -hmm. um, one of the manager, well, one of our financial guidelines is that the budget supports expense reductions, strategies, and initiatives, and there's a whole bunch listed. But my question is, I have two questions under this. Do the service fees in the clerks and assessor's office charge, that the, the service fees that are charged, do they tend to cover the cost of the service being provided? Um, when was the last time sort of we looked at, particularly within the general government section of fees, the fees being charged there? And the other one is, are there other opportunities for regionalization, organizational change, et cetera, within the gover general government budget sections to support expense reductions? So as part of our budget process, every department head has to come in and review their fees. And so it's done annually. Um, we did do a bunch of fee adjustments for the town clerk not too long ago. Um, and um, so I think that, but we don't really do an accounting of how much does it cost to issue a, um, you know, a marriage certificate versus the staff. That's, I mean, that level of detail, we just don't get into. It'd be, we could do it obviously, but um, our goal is just to make sure that we're at market conditions for in terms of charging what we charge for, for, for services that we offer. Um, and um, oh, regionalization. You know, um, I think Bernie addressed this before. It's it, we always look at it. We're looking at different things, but it 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 always presents a lot of challenges. We do, especially with water and sewer, we've done a lot of regionalization in terms of we've offered services to other communities who are in need for for certain licensed positions, and they compensate us for that. Um, you know, we talked with Hadley about some of the equipment, but uh, you know that that they were seeking, and it's always you know, um, if it's a street sweeper or whatever, everybody wants it at the exact same time in the spring. Um, and it just, the challenges of managing that just becomes overly complex, especially when you're dealing, you know, we see it already when you're dealing with a very small town versus a large, larger town that has needs. Um, but I did, you know, we I, when I talked with the town administrator in Hadley, we talked about senior services and are there are there, is there a duplication of efforts? Because people can go to either senior center and you know we can work better on that and, and encouraging our senior center directors to work closer together. Um, there are a few other things that we had discussed as put, and there are obviously a lot of water and sewer things were at that level were you know, a very good conversation going on with a lot of our neighbors. Um, we provide a lot of services to our, our many of our neighbors like um, um, Belchertown and Pelham and Leverett for, for our 
the services that we already offer, which is water and sewer. Um, so, but in terms of like day-to-day -day operation, oh, and we also, uh, I'm not sure if we do it now, we were, we were providing assessor services to town of Pelham. There, you know, Pelham has very, it's very small budget and we have staff who may have excess capacity and they pay us a little bit of money and we provide the services for them. Thanks. Uh, Sandy? You're unmuted already, um, Sandy. You're unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> If you look at the um, personnel tables in the budget, there's an explanation of the change in the um, HR. And that is that this was a position that was listed as part-time and part-time staff are not listed in the personnel table. We list full-time people. And what happened is uh, it came to be realized that that part-time person was actually working enough hours to be benefit eligible. So then that person who had been part-time became enough of a of an FTE to merit being listed in the personnel table. So it was somebody who was already there. It was just, um, she hadn't been, I think it's a she, hadn't been, hadn't been getting benefits. And then we realized that she was working enough so she was benefit eligible and that's why she's listed. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Paul, I just want to, I, you made a quick statement that seniors can go to either senior center, that we could go to the Hadley Center. I was not aware of that. I think it's excellent. So to the extent that could be aware, they, they had a, um, and I'm just going to cite one example of where this is very good news because they, they, had an arrangement with um, a company that came and did free shredding and and you could just come and get up to five boxes of stuff and we actually brought our stuff over there and I was waiting for someone to ask me to be show that I was it was at the senior center you know evidence and nobody asked me of who I was it was you know I had mass but I think that it sounds like that that if one or the other arranges it extra services um so I, I just wonder what that arrangement is i thought it was it, i think it's great if we can it, and bernie's gonna weigh in on this i'm sure it's not an arrangement it's 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 everywhere so even at this morning at the cup of joe we had someone who was from the town of hadley who says i like your senior center better so i'm over here and i decided to get the coffee you're offering and had some suggestions for us about all about vaccinations and all kinds of things but she said i'm a hadley resident because i need it all one floor um but yeah, I, I know you know other people use it. Bernie, I assume you're going to weigh in yeah, on this. Yeah, as well. any um, for senior centers and for libraries. Um, yeah, the state aid to the senior centers, the state aid to libraries, ensure that um, uh, anybody can come in and use them. So there's interchangeability there. Uh, I I did have uh, I did have a question, and it's it's unfair because I didn't submit this in advance. But I'm curious about. Uh, you know, my concern is always that we're, uh, uh, we, we do a lot. Um, and I'm always concerned about the level of staffing. And my concern and my question would be, and if you can't answer it, please get back to us, is how many vacancies are we carrying right now? Yeah, I, I don't know that answer. Um, I think we're pretty caught up uh, on a lot of them with fire and police especially. Um, DPW, I think they're pretty solid, actually. Well, I mean, we're, actually uh, within general government. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think we do a pretty good job of, uh, yeah. it's tough recruiting firefighters. It's tough recruiting police officers. It'll be difficult filling the uh, any yeah. vacancies in, in, so, in crafts for those services. But I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about general government. I'm concerned about town hall. Yeah. And so, how much stress there is and pressure on folks. Sure. So assistant DEI is a new one, um, but we're already talking some candidates who are interested in that. Um, Michelle Matusko retired from police, but then we have an internal candidate who's gonna be moving over there, which creates an internal vacancy in planning department, which planning lost their planner to become planning director in East Long Meadow, I think it was. So there's lots of recruitment going on. Planning's been a hard one for us, getting qualified planners to apply. Um, first floor tends to, their customer service desk tends to go through, you know, we've gone through a number of people there, but
But town hall, generally, IT, all, the, all of our major departments are pretty stable. People, once they're here, they, they like working for the town. Um, Angela, do you have any insight into that? You're, you're way more involved in that stuff. Um, I've been impressed with the speed of our HR director to post things and to get the ball rolling on, on search committees. So I feel like what you're alluding to, Bernie, is something that we talk about internally and we try not to talk about externally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, this is something that's, that's always concerned me both professionally and as a member of the finance committee. Um, we, we compete with private sector. And that's always been a challenge, especially in certain like skilled departments, like the, like the planning department. Uh, the other thing that's been happening is, and this was a subject of an ICMA um, white paper, uh, the cost of college is pricing a lot of people who might have otherwise come and worked for a little less money, but a little more job security in municipal uh, and state positions. Uh, they're being priced out because they, they've got those tuition payments to carry. So, um, you know, I, I'm not going to flog this anymore than I, <laughs> than I have. But <laughs> what happens um, what happens inside Town Hall is are critical functions to our success as an organization. And that's, that's my concern. Uh, I, you know, I don't look at the folks who work in town hall are simple functionaries. They're key people performing key roles that underpin the operation of the whole community. So if we're having trouble recruiting, again, again thanks to the uh, the personnel study you may find that you, you know, you, more pressure, you may find yourself uh, having to adjust uh, salaries. That's, that's my ongoing concern. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at some point I won't be on the finance committee and you guys won't be hearing from me on this, but <laughs> while I'm here, I'm going to do it. Well, Thanks. but the the one game, the one that was most significant, and this is not just in our community, but in a lot of different colleagues you may have heard about as well, Bernie, is that the state has pretty much gone to 100% remote. Um, and I talked to actually somebody at the state on Monday about this, and that's really opened up jobs to people who otherwise would not be engaging in going to Boston or something like that because they can work 100% remotely. And I think that that I know for a communications director, that was an opportunity that she couldn't pass up because they pay better than they, than we do. Um, if, it, if it required attendance at a different location, she probably would have stayed with the town. But, um, you know, you, you, you bless people for taking on, you know, they do what's best for their families. So I think that, and I think other communities like these outer lying communities that where people now are taking jobs that, for the state. And this happened with MassDOT with some of our planners who went over to MassDOT and so, I think that's the big one of the bigger challenges for us. Kathy, um, the one big one you didn't mention, Paul, when you went through vacancies is finance director, and it's mm -hmm. probably because Sandy is sitting here, and we think we've got one. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, and we know we have one, but we 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 so um. I can update you on that. Yeah. So Thanks. yeah, Sandy's been explicitly clear. I mean, so grateful. I mean, we've talked about it last week, just how much stable, how he stabilized everything by being here. So, but he's been pretty clear about, I'm leaving. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy my time most of the time. Um, so we, <laughs> we've been recruiting for finance. We've done a lot of challenge. We've had gone through a couple interviews. Um, we have an, another interview or, <clears throat> or two scheduled for Monday, I think it is. Um, Angela, and so um, hopefully this will be a strong candidate, and we can move forward with that, and that'll come to the council. And I, and I'm wondering, I mean, I don't need an answer now, but this notion that the state went remote um, to the extent I know you were allowing some flexibility with some jobs to be remote from home some days. Certainly, it's when we came out of Zoom, I don't know whether that makes a tough job like. I don't know what which jobs that appeals to people yeah. if they want to live in our area. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when we came out of COVID, I, you know, we are an in-person operation. Our We have the biggest building in the center of town. Our people have to be here. The residents expect us to be here, and we expect to be supporting restaurants and things like that. Um, that being said, the labor market has changed. People are expecting to have uh, remote work. And you know we are able to retain key employees, some on this call, because we're able to accommodate remote work. 
Um, that's and we, you know, we're trying to build that into our actual recruitment process and opening up that conversation with anybody we hire in terms of what it, what are the expectations, what are the needs. Um, it's really a department by department basis the way we manage it. It's up to the department heads to determine who can be, be work remotely. Clearly, DPW and police and fire don't really have the option, um, but other departments do. But th I find there's real value in in person being in person. So. Yeah, as someone who's personally worked both remotely and in person, uh, in person in the early part of my career, remotely in the later part of my career, it was very important early on that I got to know people, they got to know me. And then once I went remote, I could pick up the phone, everyone knew who they were talking to and we, we had a relationship. So it is important that, you know, when people first start in an organization, they're not remote. And then after some period of time, it gets easier to become remote. So it's just been my personal experience. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on to overall budget questions. Uh, Mandy, Joe, did you, uh, or Councillor Haneke, did you uh, run the questions for this? Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, they're, they're more of a much more general sense or on some of the projections you had. I'll start with the projections and the multi-year projection. Um, the F, you, you gave a multi-year thank you for that. That was part of our budget guidelines. Um, and I know multi-year projections need to be conservative both on um, expenses and revenue side. And I think Sandy addressed this a little bit in the presentation on Monday about, um, you know, how even with a projected two and a half increase of all four major sectors of municipal government, schools, library, town, um, the revenues, there's still at least a $500,000 deficit projection in all of your future year projections. Um, some are much higher than that. Is So two questions related to that. Are you concerned that the deficit in those future years won't work itself out um, when better projections are available? Like, you know, the schools are looking at a significant structural deficit with that two and a half percent increase, but but is ours sort of just as structural or is this a result of very conservative uh, state aid budgeting and and you know revenue increase budgeting and then on the other side higher expense budgeting because we don't know you know where they are with with insurance and stuff and is the, the second question to that is is that two and a half percent increase in each functional operating budget a sustainable given our contractual obligations which again you also somewhat touched on um and then an interesting thing within those projections, the pilot line appeared to have a blip in the FY25. It went up and then it came back down for 26 and 27. Could you explain why the projection in 26 and 27 for pilots is lower than the FY25 budget number? Um, I will start answering your first question. I'll have to look at pilot to figure out what that was. Um, the Deficits in the future, uh, I think, are not unusual. So seeing them there doesn't worry me too much. And the, and the size that they are with a 2.5% increase doesn't worry me too much. Um, but I do think we need to think about what could make them disappear. Um, I don't think um, there's going to be huge increases in state aid. So I would not look to that as a source. Um, and um, Amherst doesn't rely on one term like free cash to support its budget. So that's not a source. So that really leaves property taxes and local receipts. Um, I, I do think within property taxes, as I mentioned the other night, we've estimated a $650,000 increase for new growth. Um, in FY24, we did the same thing. And when new growth actually came in, it was over a million dollars. So that would 
that $350,000 would get the deficit in FY26 down to $100,000. And I mean, that's, you know, and that would carry out into the future years. So um, I think keeping an eye on new growth um, is likely to be what brings the budget into balance in the, over that period. However, there are also things that are not shown in the forecast um, that could hurt. So if our retirement assessment goes back up to six, you know, it's built in as 6% in this budget, but if there's some compensation for the fact that it was so low in FY25, that will be a bump. Uh, and then there are all the possibilities of spending more than two and a half percent, even going to 3%. I prepared a bunch of scenarios like that, that at some point, I think a presentation to the finance committee and or BCG would be appropriate and necessary. Um, and I've talked to the leaders of the council and the finance committee about doing that. And it's really just a matter of when it's convenient for people to schedule that. But um, I think that's a very important conversation that the town needs to have about what the consequence of spending and um, revenue choices are in the next few years. So it's, it's a big conversation. So I don't want to go into it more today because it really does deserve its own meeting. Um, and then on the pilot, um, let me see if I can quickly come up with what that was. Paul, I actually, in, while I'm doing that, I would say if you have other things you want to say, um, this might be a good time for you to talk while I'm looking at the pilot. Because <laughs> I know you have many important things to say on this issue. No, I think um, the the... the that larger conversation, what it looks like if we're at a two and a half percent or three percent and what it looks like at four percent or so, it's gigantic difference. It's that's why it's so important for the council and the finance committee and the school committee, in fact, and others to recognize what a percent means um, when you change something over time. Um, it it mushrooms quickly. Um, so the pilot, I mean, Joe was um an additional solar pilot of $35,000 that we put in the FY25 budget. Um, I will say that there were then some questions about what we should project that pilot out to be in the future. So it wasn't rolled into the future. So that it's just, that's why there's a difference. Okay. So that's something that in future years might clarify itself and it might not go back down. It might be there. It might, it's just that uncertainty. Okay. Thank you for that explanation as to why there's this 35 bump just for FY24. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other questions, uh, Mandy Jo? Yeah, sorry, I, I've got a couple more. I don't know if they're appropriate here or not. Um, I guess this one's more of the next quote section of revenue. So I'll wait till you get to the revenue line on our agenda. <laughs> um, but capital stabilization for the elementary school, when we were looking at the whole budget, capital stabilization is lower this year because when we authorized the elementary school borrowing, you rightfully pulled it out into whatever the elementary school is. The, 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 I guess the question is, I know, and it's maybe it's not appropriate for this conversation, but who knows? Um, the intention was that that five million would get reimbursed to capital stabilization, and we got additional state money. Um, the site work came in under budget, and so how? Wh what's the current plan for getting that five million back into the capital stabilization? Is it? Uh, are we going to use the full borrowing capability so that capital stabilization doesn't necessarily like, like where are we standing with getting that 5 million reimbursed to capital stabilization and the plan for doing so? Kathy, I think you probably can answer this. If you, if you want me to, Paul, I can jump sure. in. Go ahead. Um, you know, the, 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 when I originally 
propose taking five. It was with the knowledge that the um, Inflation Reduction Act has a big direct credit to municipal for both um, geo the geothermal, the whole system, and the solar. So those those you get the year after you you have to put the building in operation to get the credit. You know, so basically for the building, you have to turn the lights on. For the solar, you have to turn the switch for solar. Um, you and then and then you put it in. So if you think of the this for for the building, potentially we would be applying them applying for them in FY27, because the building will be opening in in September 26. So you could show by June 26. <laughs> And so it's the following year. And then solar is like which which fiscal year you can apply once it's operational. And those will be in the neighborhood. If we can get the full 30 percent, those are in the neighborhood of nearly five million dollars. And I, I'll just say an if on them, because there's there's some questions on with new federal guidelines and explanations we're under I won't get too technical here you know we're, we're there's a threshold for both of them of megawatt hours and you have to be if you're under that you don't have to have apprenticeship programs in the group that's installing for you if you're over it you don't get the full 30 percent unless they're apprenticeship programs but we're under it for both of our systems. The question is, if they add the two systems together, then are we over it for the built, the solar system? And the, so it's it's not as clear that we, if they're not in the if they're in the same fiscal year. So, but the the shorter answer is we would get it the year after. And I think the intention, Paul, was when we get those credits, they go back into reserves. Mm -hmm. and we're where we we recouping them into reserves, they'd go back into the capital fund. Can, and, can I and just so you know, call? just on the land, the early site came in under. We don't know yet with the building. Right. We. I, I know we don't know with the building, but but can I ask a follow up? Say say the borrowing, and I don't know the numbers, but if our borrowing, this is just for examples, if our borrowing authorization for the override um, or the the exclusion debt exclusion is is 50 million and we have 5 million so a total of 5 million from capital for a 55 million dollar project again making up numbers here if the if the bid comes in at 53 million will is the intention to still borrow the full 50 use 3 of capital and return the other 2 from capital to the capital stabilization so that you're only actually then need three million in reimbursements to really sort of make the capital stabilization whole, or would you borrow only forty-eight million and use the full five million for capital? Like, I guess that's part of my question about this. Since we don't know, but we got extra state money too, right? And so, where, what's the plan for that? I hope that question's a little clear. You know, I'm turning that to Paul, Paul and Sandy, but it's also the bond thing because Sean had figured out we weren't going out for all of it at once in yeah. terms of, and so that that answer is a more complicated one. Yeah. So we met with Sandy and, and Holly and, Jen, and a bunch of us met with uh, the bond rating agency Wednesday, I think, um, and hoping for and. and I'm not. I don't know. If, I don't want to speculate online, but the, not expect our fundamentals are our fund, your numbers are your numbers, right? And our sort of basic uh, wealth of our community base, because the presence of a large student body just brings us down. Um, and but I think we made a very strong pitch. They they recognized that our fundamentals and our our management team is strong and all those things. Um, but what the and Kathy's right. What we do is we borrow just as much as we need. Um, and this borrowing um, is just for a portion of what we're going to need, and because we don't want to borrow in advance. Um, and you know, the less we can borrow, we have the borrow. We needed the borrowing authorization, but doesn't mean we're going to borrow the full amount. Is it Sandy, no, that, that's just yeah. we don't know yet, Mandy. <laughs> 
Bernie? I, I was going to say, uh, uh, ask that question after the ribbon cutting. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you really don't know until the project's over and, and, and done. Um, and at what point did you have to borrow a full amount? Uh, the other thing we have to keep in mind is November is coming. And if there's a change in administration, uh, there's already been pledges to make all this green stuff go away. Um, now, I know that for the feds, stuff that's in the pipeline can, you know, can last for a couple of years after uh, after changes are made. But uh, we we need to we need to watch and see what happens on a, a national level to before we can count on that. Absolutely count on that five million dollars. I, I just say the good news on that. Uh, Bernie is the number of major industries that are drawing on that. This is a uh, not just drawing on it in terms of the credit, but it's, it's we've spurred growth in industries in the United States because because the you know so it's it's a bigger group. So when we, we, we double we check, they, they, there's other stuff that might disappear in Ira, but they thought this one's going to hold because it's it's leaped us ahead of Europe in a pretty amazing way. Um, so well, let's 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 just let's just hope, yeah. um, you, you know, because. Um, stupid yep. is and stupid does, and um, we we uh, we have to wait and see. So, any other questions on the uh, overall budget? Okay, we'll move on to our last topic, which is the projected revenues. Uh, does anyone want to start with questions, or did we send questions in on that? Councilor Haneke? I didn't send it in, but I just have one. I'm pretty sure I know what Paul's going to say to it and Sandy's going to say, but I'm, I ask it every year. Um, House and Senate budgets are out. Senate budget, in some sense, for general government and schools is better than both the House and the governor's. Um, it matches the governor's 3% in UGA, and it matches the House's 104 for Chapter 70, you know, so so it, it had some benefits from what we liked in, in some of the both of them. How does that affect um, the planning for this budget or the spending? I, I, I'm pretty sure the answer for this budget is it's not going to affect this one. You're not going to update those, those government numbers. Um, is the potential revenue from that enough that you would consider supplemental budgets that we did, I think, two years ago, um, or maybe it was three years ago when we passed a supplemental because the government spending or, you know, government state state aid was much higher than, than the budget. Um, how does it potentially affect school, library, all, all of that? Could, could you just talk about what what the plans this year are would we just basically take it in as extra money without budgeting it or it, yeah can you just talk about that i think it, you have to wait and see so you're right about the numbers the senate did pick the higher numbers what that really means when they get into conference committee remains to be seen you know it used to be that the house would always underfund umass when Stan Rosenberg was Senate president because they knew that he wanted UMass funded more so then they could get something. So there's a lot of gamesmanship that goes on in these budgets to see what trade-offs there are. Um, so given that we based the budget presented to the council on the governor's budget and we, haven't, we didn't change it with the house budget, we're not gonna change it with the Senate budget, we'll see what happens with the conference committee. But by that time, you should have finished your budget deliberations. It could, it there will be different things that will change toward the, uh, once we have final state aid numbers, once we have final new growth numbers, and that typically could be that there will be some sort of amendments that could be presented to the council in the fall. But since we don't know what those numbers are yet, it's too early to say. Is that what you expected me to say? Yes, but I thought I'd <laughs> ask it anyway. <laughs> Any other questions, uh, Kathy? Um, it's it's a question or a comment. Um, we're 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 
at probably third quarter now of knowing what this fiscal year is. And in the last several years, we've uh, generated a surplus beyond what we put on paper that we were generating. Um, so as we close out this year, the other thing that's being projected, I mean, some of that is that new growth came in at X um, or that we got interest earnings on Y, uh -huh. where, the, you know, so it, was, it tended to be more the revenue side than the expense side, although on expense, it was a little bit less. Um, as we, it's going to be not, the timing isn't right for this budget, but I would like to, you know, do in that same scenario world, try to take a look at that next year, because, um, or at the beginning of next year, next fiscal year, not calendar year, because one of the things people who are in outside groups like the school committee, they're saying, well, we if we're doing that, why don't we just grab it initially, you know, thinking of building it into the expense line. So making it clearer where that what the sources of that are, because um, I think we're budgeting appropriately. And you already mentioned the new growth one. We are um, systematically each year underestimating if we took last year as the truth but we don't know this year what this year is going to be and i don't know the extent to which um the planning department knows they've just approved two major projects like when is the start and when is the end date we would get some what ifs on new growth beyond the norm so i don't know whether that's possible or whether that's too risky to do it um and out two or three years is out two or three years. I think it's impossible because we don't know what else will be. But out one year is a little, a little easier. I'll say two things about that. One, don't forget that new growth relates back to last January first. So if planning just approves something, that won't be for new growth until next year. So um, the other thing is the six fifty number might be wrong. But it does remind me of my favorite Dilbert cartoon, where the spiky-headed boss said, Dilbert, this estimate is wrong. And Dilbert says, well, you know, he and he says, get me a new estimate. And he goes, well, I have an infinite number of numbers that are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you just have to pick one. Yeah. yeah. And my only other comment is on the scenarios. I think um, that it's excellent to know that you've got that because that is thinking about the next year, if we're back on a two and a half percent on each budget, people need to you the we just did the library budget quickly, but it was like can't begin to guess FY26. Well, you need to start thinking about FY26 when you're already planning for FY25, you know, in terms of not just the hope for, um, and school schools will be even more so. Um, so. Yeah. And I just want to weigh in just, I know you'll be under pressure to be more aggressive on your projections for revenue. And, um, and I think that our process has served the town well and has always wound up with a positive result. And we have a direct experience when the economy stopped, it collapsed and all those projections stopped and we had to cut budgets. And so I think we, we don't have to go back to the depression. We can go back three years and see what was the impact when the world stopped all of a sudden, and that can happen again. So I think being conservative because we had the resources, because we had strong projections, I think we were, we survived as well as any other, any other community. And so I think we just, you know, that's the, dis when we talk about discipline, blah, 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 it's, it really is about um, protecting our future, not about satiating our appetite today. I just want to say, Paul, I totally agree with that. And so I just think in our report, we need to emphasize that, that I, I think we're budgeting in a, in a fiscally appropriate way. When I, years ago when I taught public budgeting and I said where we can find money after the fact is you tend to do the worst case on expenditures in terms of a little on the high side and a little on the low side where where it's uncertain on revenues because you can't raise your prices <laughs> you're not mm -hmm. you can't 
we're not a private sector firm can you say the cost of cars is bigger the next year because of it um we don't have that so so we have to have you know with a little contingency in there so i think it's smart but i i just think people keep looking at it saying oh if we'd only known then we could have spent that money but then we wouldn't have had the money anyway if we had spent it so mm -hmm. i think we just need to express that in our report to the council Councilor Haneke. So this doesn't go to the FY25 proposed budget, but the prior actuals and recap, our budget, any year we pass it, plans to do and use the maximum allowable levy in property mm -hmm. taxes. Yet when we recap and when we do actuals, there's always a small number, around 100,000, that is not used of that, that levy. Can you explain how or how that happens i mean I, i'm sure it's a very simple ex explanation of something about like di dividing and math but um how how is it that we don't use the whole thing that we've budgeted um it all has to do with you can't cut a penny in half you when you set the tax rate you have to set it to a penny and that means when you do the calculation of our maximum levy that tax that theoretical tax rate will run out many decimal places, but when you have to round it to two decimal places, the difference usually ends up being about a hundred, or in Amherst's case, last few years, about $80,000. It's all just rounding. And my follow-up then is, how is that built into the expense line, knowing that, you know, you've budgeted the full cut cap? maximum levy, but you're probably not going to get that levy. Where in his expenses, since we're passing a balanced budget, where in the expense line is that sort of fit in? Is it really, is it, is it on the um, reserve for abatements and exemptions, even though it's not really an abatement and exemption? Is it kind of built into that? Or how is it built into the it, expense it just, side to balance it, the budget? It all just gets figured in um, to make so you just have to have enough revenue. So right now we've assumed we're going to get all of the tax revenue. At some point, that tax revenue number is actually going to be bigger because new growth is going to come in. So the fact that we then have to shrink it down a little bit means that we have enough taxes to cover things. And then if there are other adjustments that we need to make, um, frankly, I don't remember how Amherst how we used to do it, you have two choices. You then can bring something, you can, you have three choices. You can spend more money, come in with a supplemental budget. Two, you can lower something like your uh, local receipts estimate to bring everything into balance. Or three, you can spend more money in the sense by increasing the overlay. We, and I just don't, and Amherst has, I think has done supplementals in the last few years. So probably just brought things into balance through that supplemental. But in Arlington, for example, we always just adjusted the overlay to, to bring it into balance. So at, at the end, it's it's all about the same. You have to have a balanced budget. That's what the recap is about. Um, and then you just make these little adjustments here or there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Any other issues that people want to bring up for future meetings or otherwise? <clears throat> Don't see anything. I would just say, Bob, if I could interject sure. for a second, I'm not intending to uh, attend all your meetings. <laughs> <laughs> um, partly I'll be away, partly uh, I think in, when you talk to the departments, they are going to do a good enough job of answering about their own budgets that you don't need me. But I would say if as you go along, there are specific questions that you want to ask um, about the bu budget in a big way, um, let me know and I can either email back or show up at a, a meeting. Um, but generally, I won't be here. Fair enough. Anyone else? Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. 
Thank you. Second. Second. I just want to tell everyone schools are next week. I sent in questions. Mandy sent me some. But if you look at the elementary or regional school, you should send them to Bob and Athena. Just a reminder of what, what's next Tuesday. Uh -huh. I second adjourn. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just go around. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Aye. I am an I. Uh, Andy. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Uh, Alicia. Yes. Bernie. Wholeheartedly support. <laughs> and Matt. Matt may be gone. Silence is consent. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I th we're adjourned at 1150 AM. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good weekend. Thank you.